friends. Hey, back with part 11 of this video series that I am doing on a book entitled Be Not Deceived. And this book is written by a missionary from Philippines named Roger Curtis, and I am on his chapter 11 about the new creation. Um, as, as Christians, the Bible says that we will be new creations. Everything will be brand new. And boy, when you look at the Christians of the Bible, um, these people were on fire for the Lord. They truly were new creations. Um, it, it wasn't just some something where they said they accepted Christ or received Him or they said a sinner's prayer or, or some little thing like that and then just went back to their business as usual. No, no. This wasn't their definition of a, of, of a new creation. New creation to them was their whole life had been transformed. They had been regenerated. They had turned from sin. They had turned from darkness. They had turned to light. They had new priorities in life. Um, when Paul changed, he was, was murdering the Christians. He woke up, God awoke him, and he was a new man who was out there spreading the truth of the gospel. He was exposing the false teachings of his day, and they were turning the world upside down. These were true new creations of Christ, the apostles. Um, the disciples of Christ, they were, they were all brand new. And um, you look at someone like Zacchaeus, he was a new creation. And that was evidenced by the fact that um, he was a tax collector and he would steal people's money. And um, after he was born again, after he was a new creation, um, everything changed. He gave back all that he had stolen and he even gave back extra money to show the, the sorrow in his heart and, and, and to let people know that he was truly sorry for what he had done. Um, um, the woman caught in adultery, um, so many, you know, they, they turned from that sin. They didn't continue in it. Um, these are what new creations are all about. They love the Lord. They worship Him. They follow Him. They are brand new, brand new creatures. And, and that's what this chapter is about. Um, Roger starts out here, he says, in, uh, he's talking about the Apostle Paul. And in his epistle to the church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul refers to this change of purpose in one's life when he writes that in reference to your former life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self which is which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth Ephesians 4 22 through 24 Romans chapter 12 starts out in this way Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We make the choice to put God in the driver's seat, and in his rightful position on the throne of our hearts. And again, God is the acceptor and not us. One of, one of the, an, a very excellent verse concerning this subject is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, which says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. How are we different? What has passed away and become new? We still have the same color hair and eyes. We're still the same height and weight. We still live in the same house and eat the same food. The thing that has changed is the way we think, the purpose of our life. We now have new priorities. Before, it was self-satisfaction, the fulfilling of our own selfish desires. But now we seek the glory of God and the well-being, blessedness, and happiness of our neighbors. Before we were led by our own spirit, telling us what was good for us, and our fleshly desires, 
But now it is the Spirit of God who influences and directs our decisions and actions in accordance with His will. The difference is that the newborn believer is now walking instead of in his own selfish desires according to the indwelling Spirit of Christ. Romans 8, 5-9 through 9 tells us, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. That was Romans 8, 5-9. through 9. The Apostle Paul gives us some examples of those that represent the desires of the flesh. In the letter to the church at Galatia, he says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, this has to do with moral uncleanness, lasciviousness, which is lack of restraint, idolatry, and that is when you have uh, passions in your heart that you're more passionate about than you are about God. That's an idol that you have in your heart. Witchcraft, and this has to do, uh, especially with those using drugs and potions, you know, like uh, sorcery and all that. Um, hatred, variance, which is strife, emulations, which is jealousy, wrath, strife, seditions, which is division, dissensions among people, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in the past, that they which do, see, do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Galatians 5, 19-21. Paul goes on to say, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul makes the following warning in his epistle to the church at Ephesus after listing most of these same sins. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Ephesians 5, 6. And if we look at Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, or if we look at Romans chapter 1, 18 through 32, or Revelation 21, um, we see the same list that God has given us that shows um, the, the, the people whose who the wrath of God abides upon because they will not humble themselves to our holy God. Many of the things listed in these scriptures are commonly found in our church assemblies, and unless they are repented of and forsaken, there is no hope for eternal life. Sin in the life of the individual and in the assembly must be confronted and dealt with. And the only way that this can be accomplished is for the person to completely submit himself to the indwelling spirit of Christ and to forsake his fleshly desires. Romans 8, 13 through 14 says, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, the spirit, but if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Hallelujah. Gordon Olson says, Our struggle against temptation is in our own strength is like turning the steering wheel of an automobile without the engine running. When the engine is started and the power steering is operated, steering becomes pleasantly easy. So it is when we learn and apply God's gracious blessing of the indwelling Spirit in our lives. Instead of operating in our own flesh, we need to walk in the Spirit. William Law, the 18th century English theologian, writes, If we are to be in Christ new creatures, we must show that we are so by having new ways of living in the world. If we are to follow Christ, it must be in our common way of living every day. 
After the new birth, the indwelling Christ by his spirit is now in command and has assumed his rightful place on the throne of our hearts. Now, the love of God and our neighbor is a compelling force that governs our lives where before it was love of self. When this glorious transformation or regeneration takes place in our lives, then and only then the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, Romans 8, 16. It's not some pastor usurping the authority of the Holy Spirit telling you that you're born again. A pastor can't tell you you're born again. That's the job of the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit. The reason that so many church members need assurance of their salvation is because they have never experienced the true evidence from the Spirit of God. No one else has a right to give that testimony. Isn't this wonderful truth? Um, what an excellent chapter and just what a, what a brand new life we have in Christ. I mean, nothing, nothing compares to it. Um, next, Roger will be getting into chapter 12 on the Great Commission. So this is another excellent chapter. Thank you for listening.